So I want to talk now about uh, something a bit different, but re very much related to what Anders was, was talking about, which is how do we, uh, ha you know, accelerate some of this, this great innovation that we, we all, um, we all, all want to, to get become a part of and, and facilitate. Um, just trying to see now here how that, oh, there it is. Sorry about that. Just want to make sure I can uh, share the slides out here. So what I wanted to talk about uh, today was how we can improve this uh, customer experience that Anders was talking about at speed. You know, I think it's very important when we talk about innovation to recognize that innovation is how you solve the customer's problem. And to understand the customer's problem, you want to get your application out there, you want to get your digital experience out there, and you want to find those grimaces that Anders mentioned so you can see where the problem is and how to fix it. And to do that, you need to deploy things rapidly, agilely, and at speed. And this is why we, we want to go to the cloud. And that's what I want to talk about now is how cloud native computing can help with this process, help facilitate that uh, cycle of innovation, of ex understanding the customer experience at the speed they, they expect it to be to be given and, and fixed. So just first, a, a quick introduction to myself. I joined WSO2 last November, coming up on, on a year now. I was at Citibank before that. My most recent position there was Chief Security Architect in the Consumer Bank. Before that, I spent uh, several years as Chief Architect, Treasury and Trade Solutions, or the Institutional Bank, where security was, was part of my remit, and thus the, sort of the connection. I spent quite a bit of time there working on cloud transition, cloud migration, and uh, and cloud security. So I'm very happy to join WSO2 at a great time when we're making the move ourselves to the cloud and help out with that cloud product strategy, which is a you know big part of big part of my job here now. Uh, before all of that, I was CTO at Iona Technologies, very similar position to what I have today. So it's a bit of a back to the future for me. And uh, back in those days. I was working on web services standards and uh, was working with Sanjeeva and Paul, the founders of WSO2 at the time. And I remember very well when they told me they were going off to start a company and you know, wondering if they were a bit crazy, but look at this 16 years later and you know, what a great company it is. And I'm you know, very glad to be joining at this time, particularly when we have the chance for the next stage of significant growth uh, based on the, the new products. So what I wanted to talk about is this, uh, question of cloud native deployment uh, and how does that fit into the innovation cycle that Anders so so clearly explained uh, in his, his great talk about how we can think about the future and how we're going to get there. And I'm particular, uh, I was particularly struck about the humanity, the humane aspect of it. And I'll try to get back to that a little bit later. But first of all, I want to put this uh, uh, discussion in the context of computing uh, evolution. So uh, a bit like Anders, I'm starting a bit back in history and then going to the, to talk about the future. On the right, on the left hand side here, we see how computing was done 50, 60 years ago. This is uh, Univac, which was one of the first computers to run a business application. To run it, you went into the room, you used the computer from that room, as you can see the people here are doing, and it ran. And in those days, it wasn't even interactive. It was just batch. You fed the program in, you ran it, you got the results, and that was it until the next time you ran you ran a program. Today, on the right-hand side, this is what a modern data center looks like for a cloud provider. You cannot even get into this room if you would want to. You can't even get into the grounds of these data centers without security authorization. They are very locked down. So it's a very different model. People are not interacting directly with these computers. And what you're seeing is rows and rows of consumer grade PC servers that fulfill now the function of the, the old mainframes used to function, but in a slightly different way. And with some different characteristics that are very important to innovation and supporting the scale and speed of innovation that we need to support to get the customer experiences to the, way, the level that we need them on those digital projects. Uh, one other thing to, to say about this, uh, the older systems, you know, we had to design applications for them to get the best out of them. And for the new model, we have to design 
for that as well to get the best out of it. And that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about later. The old days, of course, computers were in a room. Computers had names. You knew where they were. You knew where your computer room was. You knew what the server names were. Even uh, today, the traditional computer room is, has those characteristics. And this, the modern computer room, you don't even have any idea what the names are of any of these computers. Somebody knows, but you don't. You don't know where your program is running, and, and you shouldn't have to care about that. This is some of the characteristics that actually will help you once you understand how to leverage them. So a little bit of a summary on this uh, compare and contrast. As I said, at one time, you went to the computer. Now the computers are everywhere. We have computers in our, in our hands. You know, Anders pointed that out as well, how the great computer, the iPhone by itself is, a mobile phone. You have a computer everywhere. It's not in a place. It's just there. Computing is called cloud computing. It's just in the cloud. It's just somewhere. It's everywhere. Uh, and cloud programs running everywhere uh, deliver the scale, resiliency, and agility that are expected for digitization. And Anderson, in his presentation, listed some of the top digital companies, Airbnb and Amazon and Netflix, that provide the, the great digital experience and are the epitome of it. They're held up as the, the gold standard for how you do this. And they all are running in the cloud. They all are running in those modern data centers. And that's what gives that kind of scale, resiliency, agility, and always on characteristic that everyone has come to expect from a digital, a digital application. So that's what we need to do as well to keep up with those guys and provide our competitive differentiation, our innovation in a way in which fulfills those expectations of the customers and gives them that, that great experience that, that they, they're looking for and that they'll get somewhere else if they don't get it from, from you. Now, how did we get here? Uh, I just want to give a brief summary of some of what has been going on to bring us to this point that we're going to talk about as to how this works and how it can be used to, to your advantage and to support the innovation. So cloud native uh, deployment uh, res is something that uh, is used to deploy applications, as I said, designed for these modern data centers. And doing that is, is the reason why, in doing, creating that design, the reason why microservices exist and why app functions are broken up into microservices with strict interface control so they can be deployed independently and evolved independently. If you look at the Amazon website, the one click button is a microservice that can be deployed anytime the team who's building it wants to deploy it and has a fix to make as long as they don't break the interface with all the other functions and capabilities on that web page. Uh, so this is what you want to achieve to be able to have that same kind of agility to push change. And Amazon's website pushes changes hundreds of times a day into production. Uh, you know, when I was working at City, we struggled to do that uh, once a month for, for some applications. So this is the kind of a step change that technology, the new technology is supporting, a paradigm shift really between the old mainframe based style and the new scale up, uh, sorry, scale out style of modern computing on hundreds of thousands of computers you know, in which you need to break up your, mic, your your functions into microservices, control the interfaces, and deploy them out there using uh, Docker containers, which recently have been standardized, not that recently, a few, maybe five, six years ago. But after microservices kind of were uh, discovered, if you will, as the way to, best way to do this, Docker containers came along to help run that microservice on any computer, so it didn't matter where it was running, didn't matter which computer it was running on in that vast array of computers. And then finally, the last sort of step in the evolution of this was the standardization of Kubernetes, which we've seen in the more recent past, uh, which orchestrates those containers across the computers. And everything now, uh, which has to be automated, as I said, you, you can't get in the room, you can't interact with the computers directly, everything has to be automated for this to work. And let's talk about what that automation is and how to think about it and how to work with it to support our innovations and our customer experience digital projects. Okay, so this is the, the analogy that, uh, that the automation is based on. It's containers, based on shipping container idea, you can have a shipping container of a standard size. It goes on a ship, it goes on a train, goes on a truck, and it revolutionized shipping. Uh, and shipping is much more efficient, except perhaps because of the pandemic, it's has a few bumps along the way now, but it's revolutionized how 
goods are shipped across the globe. And in this picture, the crane, uh, you know, the, the container analogy is Docker, and the crane is the is Kubernetes, which is taking the containers and putting them uh, where they need to go. Kubernetes is what deploys those containers into those data centers that uh, we looked at in, in the picture a couple of slides ago. Just as an interesting side note, you can actually get a data center in a container. Uh, Sun, uh, this is kind of an older picture. Sun doesn't really exist anymore, but at, at when they did, they sold racks of those little PC grade computer servers in a container. IBM still sells them, so you can get a container to run your containers in, just as a kind of a funny side note. All right, so back to how uh, this, is, this works and how, how to think about it and how it can help you. Uh, Kubernetes is standardizing the container orchestration. So basically the way it works, the development team responsible for creating a microservice develops the functionality, develops the API for that functionality, uh, hands it off to the team that runs the Kubernetes cluster using a Kubernetes config file, which tells the Kubernetes control plane where to put the containers, how many containers to run. It doesn't really tell them where, it just says how many containers to put and how many pods and Kubernetes kind of figures out in the data center where these things are going to go based on what's available, what's free, and what slots are, are there the containers can be put in. Kubernetes also provides some runtime services around making sure the containers are available, does some load balancing for scheduling, does some API discovery to, to access the APIs, and uh, provides the, the container runtime in, in the workload node. So you've got containers running in Kubernetes pods and Kubernetes control planes, taking care of all of that provisioning and making sure they have the qualities of service you need and automatically expanding the resources if you run out of resources. So everything is, is going great, right? So everything is wonderful. What could go wrong? Well, the problem is if something does go wrong, it's very not very easy to fix. You have this, this flow chart from the Kubernetes website that shows you all of the steps needed to debug a Kubernetes cluster if something goes wrong. So I think a lot of people in the industry are familiar with this, that Kubernetes complexity is hard to deal with. And a lot of companies that are digital leaders will have specific teams called site reliable engineering teams that take care of, this, to, to, of putting these Kubernetes clusters in place, running them, maintaining, operating them, making sure that they are available and are up and ready for the containers to be delivered into them and deployed into them for the microservices based applications to run and provide all that great agility and resiliency and scale of those benefits that you get from the cloud native infrastructure that everybody really expects in their digital applications. So this is a, a complexity and a, a kind of a, a difficulty. And Kubernetes is not quite so simple to set up or to bug and, and uh, maintain if something goes, goes wrong. So luckily though, I think at this point, we're at a point of the evolution of the industry around the cloud native infrastructure. It's been there about 20 years now. Uh, Google invented it about 20 years ago. And it's been you know, very, very widely adopted for all the, the reasons of the benefits that we've been talking about that it gives to the digital applications. But we can tell that Kubernetes has become the standard because everyone is offering it. We can assume that some kind of flavor of Kubernetes is going to be wherever we want to deploy our uh, cloud native applications. We can see AW, Google Cloud, Azure, Oracle Cloud, DigitalOcean, Linode, there's plenty of on-prem solutions for Kubernetes, Rancher, OpenShift, Nomad. Uh, so some flavor of Kubernetes is, is always going to be there, whether you're running a private cloud, running in the public cloud, and we can say, start to say, okay, let's, Let's assume we're going to build, we can build a platform on top of this. We know it's always going to be there. And we can abstract away that complexity and start offering those capabilities in it that you need on top of Kubernetes that you need for your application, such as handling multi-node and multi-cluster environments, hybrid environments, where some pieces are running on-prem, some pieces are running in the cloud, handling the secrets, config management, identity access management, specific CICD for Kubernetes, for Docker containers to be put in Kubernetes. How do you do storage, monitoring, logging, API access, uh, one-click uh, Helm deployment catalogs. All of these things now can be built on top, on a platform on top of Kubernetes and help 
abstract these these difficulties with deployment and help support what you want to accomplish without having to deal with that you know that difficult complexity of Kubernetes cluster uh, setup and config and, and management. So our thought is, how about a Kubernetes platform for APIs? This is our, our new product called Corio. And our thought here is to abstract the deployment aspect of cloud native computing so that it's very uh, easy to deal with and you can spend your time on, uh, I think it was uh, what Anders said about more humane types of creativity and less time on fiddling around with the technology and worrying about the details of how everything gets deployed into the cloud so you can get the benefits of the cloud for your innovation, for your creativity, for your customer experience. This is a vision of, of Corio. It's out in beta. Please try it. Uh, let us know what you think. What I want to talk briefly about on this picture is that first of all, we're abstracting the development piece uh, of this cloud native computing. And I haven't talked much about that today because I've been focusing on the deployment piece, which is, uh, I think, sometimes more challenging and can be more valuable for, for a solution if you get something that's very easy to work with. But we do have a developer abstraction as well. Uh, you know, I think Taz uh, talked about this very early in his, his uh, initial talk about how uh, everyone has to participate in the development of digital projects, uh, products because all companies are becoming software and technology companies and Anders uh, reinforced this as well. And in that context, we need to have these kinds of abstractions for developers. Citizen developers have a no code abstraction for them, ad hoc developers, a low code abstraction for them and enterprise developers or pro developers need to access the code. Uh, and we need to have abstractions for all of these levels of skill to allow everyone to participate and everyone to join in the development of these new types of applications, the services, the integrations, and the APIs, and then feed it in to the ops area uh, to, uh, to automatically kick off the build, test, deploy, and run pipeline, publish the API, consume the APIs uh, from an API marketplace representing existing services, SaaS APIs that are brought into the environment that help create the new digital experiences from combining APIs with new services. And so our thought is let's abstract the development piece of the, 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 uh, the challenge here with some low code and no code abstractions for developers become more productive there and abstract the operations aspect, the deployment aspect, so that once something has been developed, there's really one button you click and it, everything just gets deployed out to to uh, to production. This one gives a bit of a more uh, characteristic of the platform features, low code integration, microservices, service mesh if needed. Um, inputs to this are this, of course, the solution architecture, domain driven design to figure out the granularity of the microservices, the API first design, the relationship of the microservices, all of this really has to be done. And we, we can help with that as well with our consulting services. but. There's many ways to, to do this, to create those designs before approaching the platform to start the development through these abstractions, create these low code integrations and microservices, deploy the code out to GitHub, trigger DevOps pipelines and trigger a GitOps configuration uh, mechanism to, to, to define the handoff into Kubernetes. So we've got the code coming into DevOps, putting it to Docker containers, automatically generating the Kubernetes config files for the handoff to Kubernetes, deploying it out, publishing the API for those integrations and microservices where into the marketplace where we can also consume the APIs. Uh, for completeness, the platform includes observability to see that the code is running correctly, security compliance and compliance for zero trust deployments uh, into the zero trust network, AI and machine learning, to help you code this correctly in the first place, giving coding suggestions for data mappings, protocol selections, connector selections. Uh, and observability also helps with latency and performance characteristics uh, with the platform. So just to wrap up and summarize the evolution of API platforms, based on the maturity of Kubernetes, we know from the evolution of this cloud computing 
paradigm through microservices, Docker containers, and Kubernetes standards, that we can assume Kubernetes is there and start to build platforms on top of it to abstract and help uh, eliminate a lot of the complexity and improve the productivity and help developers spend more time developing and eliminate a whole class of issues around uh, funding and setting up SRE teams and CICD teams. And you can do that if you want uh, with this tool, but we think there's a lot of benefit to having uh, someone do it for you now that the platform of cloud native computing, sorry, now that, now that, sorry, now that cloud native computing is sufficiently mature to build this kind of platform on top of it. And okay, everybody says Kubernetes is there uh, until something else comes along, but I remember, you know, 20 years ago, web services came out. Uh, everybody said something else will come along, but we still have, and that's true, something else did, but we still do have a lot of WSDL and SOAP out there. So for now, at least for the foreseeable future, the industry standard is Kubernetes for container orchestration, Docker for containers. Sorry, Heroku, Cloud Foundry, OpenStack, Mesoswarm, all the contenders for this standard now uh, have to kind of go by the wayside and we can assume Kubernetes is going to be there. Okay, there are problems, challenges with Kubernetes, but these are solved by abstracting the flavor into a platform. And now we know that Kubernetes is going to be there. We can deploy, auto deploy, can develop and auto deploy APIs and microservices with confidence into the new environment and focus on our creativity, focus on our innovation, focus on our customer experience. I'd just like to, to wrap up by talking about uh, one example. I want to be clear, this is not a WSO2 customer, but it is a very well-documented and well-known case study of a company moving from an on-prem environment entirely into the cloud. And they this is what they say about their experience in their case studies that they published uh, mostly on the Amazon website because they did move to AWS. And they say they have achieved by moving to the cloud a competitive advantage, a competitive edge, because now they can serve customers at the speed they demand. And this is because they have the agility and speed to market of using microservices, of breaking the problem up and iterating more quickly, pushing change more quickly, finding out what those customer problems are, identifying those grimace points, fixing them, putting them out multiple times a day, not in weeks or months, and help get the competitive edge because now they're providing that improved customer experience much more quickly and much more effectively than they could have done before when they were running on sort of pre-cloud old, you know, I don't want to say all mainframes because it's not all mainframes, but it's more that kind of approach, which is less agile and doesn't give you the benefits of the new approach uh, that, that they have achieved. They've also said that they call themselves now a technology company that offers financial services as digital products. So a proof point of that part of the discussion, deliver innovation more quickly because of AWS features and technologies, developers are productive very quickly. But here, uh, last but certainly not least in the, in, the, uh, in the information that we get from their experience, that they had to invest in, in the governance function quite a bit to security practices to make sure cloud is, is, uh, is secure because there are more challenges in the public cloud for security and training for, for cloud literacy. Overall, this took them four years. It was a four-year journey to get from the on-prem environment and the old way of doing things into the cloud environment and the modern way of doing things to achieve these benefits. And we achieve these benefits in a lot less time. It shouldn't take anyone four years. Now that we know what the challenges are, now that we know what the technology is, now that we have the Kubernetes standard and we're able to build platforms on it and abstract that complexity, we should be able to reduce this time significantly. And that's our goal with Corio. Uh, 